Hello, friends. It's Chop. He declares the, t- the he declares the heavenly kingdom of transcendent peace in January of 1851. Green Standard troops try to harsh his mellow. He he defeats them. Now there's tens of thousands of followers, and they start moving north. And wherever they go, they're able to take the local city from the understaffed, undermotivated Green Standard garrison, and then quickly gain huge conversions to the cause. Because when they came to a city, they would do a couple things. They would declare the land in common, uh, declare the overthrow, to the la- overthrow of the landlords and the, of the landlords and the combination of property, and then also uh, have a huge massacre where they killed every Manchu in the city. Uh, because these were the demons. So every Manchu quarter within every city they took was uh, destroyed down to the last person. So you have this imposition of social justice, which gets people like the dispossessed Hakka to convert in droves. Uh, you've got this punishment, this sacrifice of the, of the, of the sinful uh, rulers, Another thing they did was destroy the shit out of Buddhist and Confucian temples. They went on an iconoclastic spree, just like the Puritans of England uh, and the early Muslims. And then you have a, a doctrine of uh, religious life in there, too. Uh, whereas Joseph Smith enforced polygamy, Hong Ji Khan abolishes polygamy. Uh, he also uh, uh, abolishes foot binding, which was a, a practice common in many Chinese cities, and and recruited women into the army, and made a real attempt to uh, create sort of an austere gender equality, where women would gain equal rights to men, but men and women would be strictly so, uh, sexually segregated. There were women in the army, but every other element of uh, Taiping society was supposed to stress separation between men and women uh, to avoid temptation. And uh, the removal of vice became a crudal, crucial element of the Taiping religious tradition and its interpretation of Christianity, mm-hmm. which was literally misinterpretations, mistranslations of the Ten Commandments. But of course this is inevitable because a religious attempt to create heaven on earth through the lens of Christian social teaching and values is, of course, going to have to also impose a private morality in addition to the public morality of, of uh, communal land ownership and uh, the abolition of class. <clears throat> if it is to be a truly transcendental religious movement, uh, it has to be totalizing because this is proto-socialism, and this is what proto-socialism always looks like. It's why the proto-socialism of European peasant rebellions invariably included massacres of nearby Jewish shtetls. So they start rolling, and they eventually have hundreds of... They're, they're rolling through the middle, uh, up through the guts of China, into the, into the, uh, the land between the rivers, the, the heartland. And the, the, uh, red, the, blue, the green standards are completely incapable of meeting them anywhere. And the motivated people within the Taiping Heavenly Kingdom, uh, are able to create an efficient, motivated military uh, fueled by a conscription system that saw one every household required to uh, provide one adult male for the army. So the army was the, the most important, the key institution. There was an attempt to do wide-ranging reforms of bureaucracy and... Uh, tax collection, and as I said, uh, communization of land and the creation of communal treasuries. But what that meant in practice is, is that a lot of the trade uh, that defined urban life was basically shut down. Uh, but of course, there was, uh, but of course, that trade would have been drastically reduced anyway because, well, the Taiping were able to roll over uh, these parts of China, uh, it came with a massive cost. This war was a total war of devastation. Uh, everywhere that it touched, the local agriculture was completely decimated, and cities were usually burned or uh, destroyed 
and as I said, in, uh, entire populations within them massacred, which just just made the local economy collapse. But because of the because of the religious fervor of those participating in it, they were able to stand up an actual relatively effective state that could go hand to hand and go toe to toe or could go toe to toe with the declining Qing empire because eventually Nanjing, the old imperial capital in is captured in March of 1853. The, the uh, massive green standard army de decimated by the King and, uh, and the city taken and uh, it's, Imperial palaces are entered into in triumph by Hong and his supporters and family members. He has his top guys, his 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 cabinet, basically his 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 marshals. His version of Napoleon's marshals are people who had come up with him over the course of those early years, had made the early successes, mostly came out of the striving Hakka classes, uh, which disproportionately came from came from wage earners, uh, fewer merchants, very few landlords, though there were some of them, uh, especially in the early days. But it acquired a messianic, sort of Han nationalist character too, because it could t they could tell a story that, that made the rule of the, of the uh, Qing uh, metaphysically repugnant. And in, and in these early days, uh, just like Napoleon's marshals or Muhammad's early followers uh, the cream rose to the top and they were all dubbed by hong to be different uh kings of the empire one was uh the south king the north king the west king the east king and the wind king and they take they take nanking and it's immediately invested in a siege that lasts for years but this is the point when the taiping heavenly kingdom goes from sort of a rebellious a front to an actual manifesting state. And it's able to build sort of the rudiments of an internal structure with Nanking as the capital. There are attempts to uh, go north in the northern expedition to take Beijing, which fail, which is the first real uh, bump in the road in terms of advancement for the Taiping. They, they, they can't get Beijing. Which of course speaks to you know, south-north divide in China and how uh, strategically important that has been historically. But the, there's a uh, expedition west that actually does gain some territory. So at this point, the Western powers start finally really paying attention because uh, they of course have been trying to pry open China as a market for a while now, uh, and they now have a number of trade concessions on the coastal cities centered in Hong Kong and Shanghai where there is a business to conduct and they want conditions to, to conduct it. And uh, many of them started asking the question of, could we have a better deal with these Taiping fellows than with the emperor who's been resisting us this whole time? We just had to fucking blow his doors open in the opium war. And there's going to be a second opium war during the fucking Taiping Rebellion, where French and uh, British troops go all the way to Beijing and uh, burn down uh, the empire, emperor's garden. Just, it's just an end zone dance. It's just, it was basically a putative expedition, a rap on the nose. And there are some Westerners who really do dig the Taiping, and they love that they're Christian, and they love the idea of converting China to Christianity. But over time... Details come out, and a lot of the European Christians can't really reconcile what uh, the Heavenly Kingdom is doing with their understanding of Christianity. And of course, class rule is absolutely part of that. One thing that definitely doesn't help the attempt of the Taiping to establish legitimacy for their Western would be allies is that after the failure of the Northern Expedition, there is uh, a inevitable, I guess, turn uh, of the upper, uh, the upper levels of the movement against one another because this is a prophetic tradition. Uh, that means you got anybody at any time can claim that God is speaking through them. 
uh, and because and Hong sort of retreats from power as his movement gains success. Uh, he is unable to assert an independent will on this thing that's moved well beyond his understanding. I think of what he ever of what he ever imagined would happen. Uh, he was going to bring about the end, and he probably if. He, you know, at the he probably thought for most of it early on that that many was going to be executed by the state, but do so in a way that would allow him to meet God afterwards and be re-embraced as his son. But now he's actually an emperor in his own right, control of a vast area of territory. His closest followers start competing with one another for influence over him and start uh, distrusting one another. And there is a uh, essentially a self-purge of the top leadership where some of these uh, kings, uh, these directional kings, uh, start getting the axe. Uh, they kill each other. They are killed in turn by Hong, who is able to assert his control, but at the expense of uh, decimating his most effective commanders. So in 1856, there is a civil war, basically, within the upper ranks of uh, the movement, which severely undermines Taiping and gives the empire, which is absolutely reeling at this point, a chance to catch its breath and reorganize. So the Green Standard Army has been totally washed at this point and lost any confidence. The the emperor has lost all confidence in uh, it. So they commission a civil servant, a Han civil servant named Zhang Guofan to essentially build a new army from scratch that will have any chance of facing uh, the Taiping in battle. And so instead of the decrepit structures of uh, the Green Standard Army, he goes to the existing networks of local militia kept by local leaders in the province of Hunan and gets them to contribute tax uh, money and personal wealth to the building of an army, and and importantly, the paying of of an army, the creation of a professional command uh, by guys who uh, are getting paid way more than the Green Standard chumps were uh, and would be more effectively trained and utilized. So in 1860... The Taiping were able to put together one their last big, bold, stunning victory when they out when they were able to break the siege of the army around Nanking, totally put the besiegers to flight, and then plunge into eastern ch- central China towards Shanghai, and it's when the Taiping get near Shanghai, that the Western governments get off, of the, get off the bench, basically. They've been watching both sides. They've been mulling who will be better for business. But they have one situation which allows for business to be conducted under the Qing. And here come the Taiping to the gates of Shanghai. And who knows what they will do? The stories that had circulated about what happened to towns that had been taken by the Taiping, which a lot of them were sensationalized propaganda, were taken at face value. It was the danger of the Taiping destroying the status quo was far greater in the minds of the Western diplomats and governments uh, than the potential benefit they might bring by getting the, the Europeans better deals uh, on trade if they took power. Christianity, Smishtianity at the end of the day, about that bag. <clears throat> so the Taiping high watermark comes at the gates of Shanghai, where they are repulsed in part by a small mercenary army made up of European and American soldiers, sailors, and roustabouts who were just knocking around Shanghai. They were originally commanded by an American mercenary named... Frederick Townsend Ward, who is a real fucking piece of work. He had been one of William Walker's filibusters uh, in the effort to try to take over Nicaragua for Cornelius Vanderbilt. And he'd been a Texas Ranger. He was the first ballot Hall of Fame 
American Imperial Spear Carrier. And he took the money of uh, the Qing government to put together a effective force of about 5,000 men who were instrumental in driving back the Taiping from the gates of uh, the city. And at that point, uh, the tide begins to roll back. The ever-victorious army pushes, uh, consistently pushes back the Taiping forces who had come towards Shanghai. Meanwhile, uh, the Zhang army created by by Zhang Guofan is up and running, uh, motivated, effective. The poor guy was uh, Zhang Guofan was not a general. He was a paper, paper pusher. He was a guy who had done great on all those fucking tests that Hong couldn't pass. He w- he's gallant to Hong Jihuan's goofus. Uh, and he is tasked with the Manchu government of fulfilling his Confucian duty, which he believed in, by reimposing order. And they had a point, because this war was p- killing millions of people. Everywhere it touched, the lands died, the crops died, the people therefore died. And there's a huge internal migration of people away from the territories that were touched by the war. It would be the highest virtue to stop this. That is what he told himself, even though he was a Han in the service of the Manchu. He had a deeper Confucian duty, which is exactly the thing that Hong Shifuan fought was the demonic false religion imposed by the Manchus. He was being manipulated by Archons, basically. But he was, if he was, it worked well because the Zhang army is able to uh, start rolling back these gains and recapturing uh, these cities and getting huge numbers of, at this point, poorly paid, poorly uh, provisioned troops to desert. And in every city that was taken, there was another massacre to match the earlier massacre of the Manchus. So when the Manchus had taken power, they had required every adult male to shave the front of their heads and put the ha- their hair into a double-plated ponytail down their back called a queue. And there had been huge resistance to that in the 17th century. There had been wars. It, uh, it took much. It took the, the, the Qing probably 10 years longer than it needed to to t- conquer China because they insisted on making the Han do this. And so one of the first things that the Taiping did, of course, was say, fuck that shit, grow your hair out. So they were known as long hairs by the, by the uh, loyal Chinese. So anybody who was encountered who had long hair just could get their head cut off. They would just do it in an assembly line fashion. Meanwhile, in Nanking, uh, the Heavenly Father is starting to lose it. He starts doubting everybody, especially after the Civil War and his top leadership. He's kind of growing isolated and decadent. Uh, meanwhile, out in the field, many of his commanders are starting to defect. And so by 1864, once again, Nanking has been surrounded by the enemy. This time, not the Green Standard Army, but the, the Hunan Jiang Army of Zhang Guofan, which has proven itself in battle at this point. Supplies, food are running very, very scarce inside the city. And Hong orders his subjects to uh, eat manna, which is a biblical term that he encounters in his studies of the Bible and interprets to be uh, local medicinal herbs, which leads him to start eating weeds that he finds on the palace. Uh, That makes him sick. Uh, He dies on June 1st, 1864. Uh, He might also have been poisoned. Uh, but at that very moment, basically, uh, sappers of the Qing dynasty are digging trenches under the main walls of Nanking. And uh, three days after Hong's death, uh, the detonation brings down the walls. The city is taken by the Qing. There is, of course, a huge massacre of Taiping rebels. Hong's body is disinterned, beheaded, burned. Eventually, his ashes were shot out of a cannon to prevent anybody from uh, turning his grave into an altar. Now, it's crucial. It's important to say that this isn't just the, the uh, result of the Qing getting better 
and the Taiping getting worse over time at dealing with the situation. <laughs> There's the hand of the Western governments because one of the reasons that Shanghai fell is the refusal of the British Navy, which was there, to, to allow the uh, Taiping to take it. And they provided naval logistical support to the ever-victorious army, which after the death of Townsend in 1863 is commanded by uh, General Charles Gordon, who would eventually die a martyr to the empire in Khartoum, Sudan, uh, and who would, after his time in China, forever be known as Chinese Gordon. And he's a weird uh, Volsell freak, one of the real mutants of the British imperial project. Uh, and he takes over the ever-victorious army and helps put paid to the Taiping rebels. It takes another decade to roll them up everywhere, and groups of them spill out to, or to become bandits and fight wars in Laos and Vietnam. But 64 is sort of the death of, it, of the Taiping as a state. And given the, the cycles of Chinese history and the, 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 man, the, the way the mandate of heaven had historically worked, uh, there was no denying that the uh, Zhang Fen Emperor of the Qing had lost the mandate of heaven. Not only was a huge swath of his country in the hands of the Taiping, but there was a massive uh, uprising in northwest uh, among Chinese Muslims. And there was endemic piracy on its rivers. There, was, there were, in 1860, there were fucking British troops stomping their muddy feet in the Forbidden City. No one in Chinese history had lost the mandate more than the Zhanfen Emperor, and the sort of tidal logic of Chinese history was that he should have been overthrown. But because history moves in one direction and China is only part of a world system, by 1860, there was this Western power, this coalition of otherwise competitive European imperial states that had a shared interest in seeing the king reimpose stability into the Chinese market. And they were able to tip the Coke machine back from falling over. But of course, it's not for long. The decentralization of military power that comes from the creation of the Zhang Hunan army becomes a permanent feature of Chinese politics after this and contributes to, uh, and it contributes to the dissolution of the, of the dynasty in the next decades. Because this was a sick, sick man propped back on the throne. This is a terminal patient propped back on the throne by the Western powers. And it was not long for the world, no matter what they did. So in 1905, there is a nationalist revolution led by Sun Yat-sen, who grew up in the same province as Hong, grew up hearing tales of the Taiping rebels from people he lived amongst. And... and lionized Hong as a visionary, someone who saw the opportunity to turn China into uh, a real nation. And then after the nationalist government collapses into warring factions and the Communist Party is driven out of the cities, figures like Mao recognize in the figure of these Hakka dispossessed peasantry, the ones who form the, the majority of, that formed the majority of the Taiping army, uh, he saw the, the material for a rural proletarian military force. And so but by the time of the Long March, when 80,000 Red Army troops and family members and camp followers began their long march away from encirclement from Chiang Kai-shek's nationalists, that army is 70% Hakka. It's the exact same social base that fueled the Taiping Heavenly Kingdom. And Mao, Mao sought to commemorate the Taiping as a proto-socialist proto movement, and they certainly are. But in the 1860s, that social formation lacked the structure imposed by the existence of an industrial working class within it, which had not yet cohered uh, by this point in these parts of China. The Chinese communists are able to succeed by harnessing traditional forms of pre-capitalist exploitation with the 
industrialized working class that has emerged in the cities since then. I want to come back at the end here to the comparison of Joseph Smith and Hong Jifang. Both of them ended up failing in their goal to bring heaven to earth. Both of them had within their lives the knowledge that they had been defeated by the earthly forces of evil that they were in contention with. But Mormonism was able to survive in the main by a internal migration to expand, to live as they wanted to, to create a social equilibrium with market capitalism on their own terms, not through violence against the state directed upward, but by adhering themselves to the greater imperial, the greater imperial violence of dispossessing natives from North America. And so Mormonism got to be a vastly influential and powerful segment of the American people. But the heavenly kingdom could only come into fatal conflict with the state because that option did not exist. All that land was spoken for. Uh, plenty of Hakka uh, did respond to the worsening conditions of the 19th century by emigration, but they emigrated to other countries where they were a hyper-exploited uh, hyper proletarian, uh, like in the United States. Uh, some of them became merchants, uh, but they were all as minorities within a greater uh, foreign polity that tolerated them lightly, if at all. So nothing is able to cohere there. It must wait another historical cycle until it is embodied by another fusion of peasant resentment at dispossession with a utopian, apocalyptic, European intellectual concept developed by people who had progressed farther in the process of capitalist state and cultural formation. And now with these with new conditions, with intensified technology and intensified urbanization, that ideology, that utopian horizon can be effectively harnessed to not just challenge for power and hold power regionally, which the Chinese communists did for many years uh, while they were in contest with the nationalists and eventually the, Ch the Japanese for control of the country. And that's one of the things that makes the Chinese Communist Party now so interesting is that their conception of uh, communism is nationalist, yes, as it is going to be in any uh, state that experienced colonization uh, from outside rather than in. The nationalism of uh, the Chinese Communist Party is deeply enmeshed in a, the traumatic memory, the traumatic cultural memory of this period. Uh, the opium wars, the intervention against the Taiping, uh, then, uh, then the, the boxer incursion, and then the horror show, the millions killed by Japanese imperialism during World War II. And it'll be interesting to see how that colors the Chinese response to uh, the unfolding crisis of the 21st century that we're currently dealing with. I guess we'll find out one way or the other. Until then, good night. you